Hello guys, what's going on then? It's your boy Ben Gregson here and I'm going to be bringing you today my top 10 favourite monsters of all time. Now I'm not including XYZs, fusions or synchros. This is because I'm going to make separate videos on each of those types. I will be including pendulum monsters in this video even though there are no pendulum monsters in this top 10. Spoiler, I don't like pendulums. Actually, there's one, and I completely forgot about it. But yeah, there is one pendulum. Anyway, just as a heads up, this video does contain something called an opinion. Now, a lot of you people may be unaware, but an opinion is my favorite thing. I, I have an opinion, and you will respect my opinion. If you guys think there are better cards to have in this top 10, even though they're my top 10 favorite cards, then please leave them in the comments below. Let me hear your top 10 favorite monsters. And anyway, let's get into it. So at number 10, we have Venus. Now, the Agent of Creation Venus was basically, I played Agents as my first quote unquote meta deck. Um, this was, God knows how long ago. But it was when I first started playing Dueling Network in 2011, 2012. And Agents were the best deck in the game. It was Agents and Insectors, and there was another deck that I can't quite remember. But I played Agents for that time, and the thing about Agents was there was lots of different variants of the deck. There was Chaos variants, there was Pure variants, there was Christian variants. But one card that stuck across all the variants I played was Venus, and Venus was a playmaker. Like, you could summon Venus, pay 1k, summon two shine balls or 3k depending on what you had in hand and then you could overlay for a gachi or you could make a synchro play using gen x ally birdman and yeah venus was just an all-around great card and it was one of the cards that helped me learn the game personally so on to number nine we have literally a card i was just talking about if we can find it gen x ally birdman the key to my Karakori OTK deck, and the key to pretty much every Synchro deck I played. So, <laughs> I actually used to play Birdman in Quasar, believe it or not, and I also played Birdman in Frog Monarchs. I'll go into detail on that deck later on, because there was a lot of fucking weird tech in that deck. Um, but Gen X Ally Birdman was a way of me making the big locomotive dude, I uh, can't remember its name, and I'm probably not going to look it up. But there was a dark machine, Synchro Monster, and you used to sync Jet Outside the Birdman and Caius, and it enabled you to take control of another monster. I'm going to quickly look at it. I'm probably not going to be able to find it, am I? I'm just going to be sat here looking. Anyway, while I look for this incredibly good monster, there we go. Uh, basically, when this card is summoned, you take control of a monster, you monster your opponent controls with the highest level. Now, Big Eye was around at the time, but you're not going to take fucking Big Eye in Monarchs, so this was the next best thing. So what i do was I would bounce a frog, say Swap Frog, or Dupe Frog, usually. And I would summon Gen X Ally Birdman while I had Caius on board, and I would Synchro, and then I could possibly OTK through Locomotion R Gen X. So that was one of the weird engines I ran. And next up is possibly a controversial card, and not a card that many people actually played, nor did many people actually enjoy the deck anyway. But this is the card I am on about. So we are going for Scrap Chimera. Now, I played Scraps basically once they got Scrap Factory, which is this field spell here. I played Scraps for say about two or three months when I was still in the Alpha Pack clan. Uh, still, I don't even know if Alpha Pack is still around, but anyway. Um, me and a couple of friends at Alpha Pack were basically testing Scraps and I was the one that took it to a whole new level and kind of took it to events and took it to tournaments online and dueling network and I won a few of them with this scrap deck and when you can go triple scrap dragon turn one it's pretty fucking ridiculous 
and Scrap Chimera was that playmaker, along with Scrap Orthros as well. But Scrap Chimera is on here because it's essentially the mass chameleon of the deck and the real playmaker. And then on to number four. Now number four, uh, not sorry, number six. Is it six? Ten, nine, eight. Oh, number seven. I cannot fucking count. So. <laughs> Here we are at number 7, and this is possibly, I'd say, one of the cards that is closest to me personally, and that is my man, Inferni Archfiend, you'll forget from you missed. Now, a lot of you guys will be wondering, wow, this card's higher than Inferni Archfiend for Ben, and yes, there is, there's a lot of cards higher than Inferni Archfiend. Infernities were the deck that I played, but Infernity won the one and only archetype for me and they weren't Infinity Archfiend wasn't the only card that I genuinely liked in the game. Like Infinity Archfiend was great and the Infinity deck was absolutely fucking amazing and if I ever had the opportunity to play the Infinity deck at full power again, you damn well know I'll be playing the Infinity deck at full power again. They could completely take the ban list away and had every broken deck in the game. And like Butterfly Dagger, Elmer, OTK, with even more consistent cards, Card of Safe Return, Zombies, shit like that, and I'd still just play Infernity. That, that's the kind of guy I am, and Infernity was my biggest learning curve, and Infernity is the reason I probably am as good as I am at this game. Learning every single Infernity combo that there was to learn, learning how to play Synchro Infernity, XYZ Infernity, Hero Infernity, and this card basically was the centerpiece to all of this learning and my big learning curve and probably me making YouTube videos today because I remember making a really old channel um, and doing it on Infinity Art Feet in Infinity Combos and bearing in mind I was no more than 16, 15 years old and I had the squeakiest, this was 2012 so I would have been 15 and I had the squeakiest voice ever but I was still making videos, and Infinity Archfiend was like, like Infinity was the first deck I ever made a video on. And if you, if you want, guys, if I get to 100 subscribers, I will upload that Infinity combo video just for so you guys to piss yourself laughing at. But anyway, on to the next one. Now the next one is quite a decent card, and I cannot spell, so that's good. We're going with Relinquished. Now, anybody who's played me in the last month knows that I've been testing this Relinquish deck. Um, it's kind of like Relinquish, Shadol, Monarch, bullshit, basically. <laughs> um, we lost Chicken Game and we lost Upstart, which meant that the deck was a little bit less consistent. But I've still been playing the deck and I've still been really enjoying it. Um, admittedly, everybody's signing Mask of Wishcrook nowadays, so... Playing Relinquished wouldn't really be the most viable option in the current meta, but I still have the Shadol engine as well. Uh, making Winder and then summoning Relinquished and just constantly stealing your opponent's monsters is really fun. Um, also, using King Kabayo, summoning King Kabayo, special Relinquished, and then steal your opponent's monster, then overly link Relinquished and King Kabayo into a rank 1. Still a pretty good play. Um, but also, Relinquished holds a special place in my heart because it's owned by my favourite anime character uh, from the Yu-Gi-Oh series and that is Pegasus. Pegasus was everything I want to be really. He's a millionaire who enjoys cartoons. I mean, admittedly he's a bit of a psychopath and I wouldn't be stealing souls from anybody but like his characteristics and the way he was just... yeah, he's definitely my favourite character in the game but this isn't about that so yeah, Relinquished is at number 5. And number four, we have this little guy. Why, Konami, did you put this card to one? <laughs> well, I know why you put it to one, but Dino Rabbit was a bitch. But I didn't even play Dino Rabbit, that's the funny thing. I played Rescue Rabbit in Ninken Dog Fire Fists. Now, we'll look at, take a quick look at... Ugh, take a quick look at Ninken Dog. So, Ninken Dog, you see... Level 4 normal monster with 1800 attack and he was a beast warrior. But he was also wind. This gave me access to Lightning Chidori. This allowed me to make pluses. This was just a really fun deck to play. 
This was during plus one fire fist format as well. So it was just after Rescue Rabbit got hit, and I was always there like, if Rescue Rabbit didn't get hit, this deck would actually be viable, and I could play this a lot more. But obviously, Ninkendog, never to be a viable meta breaking card ever. But Rescue Rabbit was part of my learning curve as well. Learning how to play Rescue Rabbit and also learning the... I kind of learnt the XYZ mechanic uh, through playing, like, Dino Rabbit and stuff like that. Because when I started, it was like... Well, when I started playing properly, it was before... Well, it was just when the XYZ mechanic came in and I was struggling and I was playing shit like Volcanics and all sorts of stuff like that because my friend Karish recommended me doing that, like, doing that like to me. And I just realised this is one big history lesson for you guys about me personally. Um... But yeah, Rescue Rabbit definitely deserves to be up there. And next on the list has got to be one of my favourite cards of all time. And you can't disagree with me about this being a really, really, really good card. And that's my man Drawbird. No, I'm joking. No, Drawbird can stay in the side deck. We are talking... Elemental Hero. I won't even type that in, but I will type in Voltic now. Voltic was part of one of my favourite decks. Basically, after Infernity got hit, I started playing this Elemental Hero deck, and it was based around, obviously, Voltic just beating up your opponent down and special summoning aliases. And this was my venture into I don't want to play meta anymore, I want to play something different. And this was when the Drawbird stuff started. This was when I was playing Monarchs during Gear Gear format and playing Countess to Hat and just playing like Fossil Diner hand shit to stop things like Hat and what was the deck called? I can't remember the name of the deck now. And I've played in that format for so long. Lightsworn. Things to stop Lightsworn as well. Uh, my friend A. Hill will agree that Lightsworn was his favourite deck at the time, and it was one of mine as well. But Lightsworn doesn't really deserve a place on this list. I don't particularly like the Lightsworn cards, I just played the deck for fun. But yeah, Voltic definitely deserves a place, and he will be very much played for me in the future. Now, the next card is another controversial pick. And a lot of people will be like, oh, everybody loves that card. And that's Max C. Now, Max C is obviously a good card. There's no putting that down. Max C was an incredible card. And it, you stick Max C in the correct format, and Max C will do work for you. And But the reason this card is on this list is for the amount of times. My opponent has been on 200 life points, and I need just to top deck something to beat the shit out of them, and I top deck a Max C. <laughs> like, I've top decked Max C per game over the time I've been playing the game, at least like 200 times, at the very least. Like, it happens way too often, and it's great, don't get me wrong, but it, I kind of think it's a bit disrespectful doing that to somebody. It's kind of like the biggest like Yu-Gi-Oh! T-Mag, other than killing somebody with a good old draw bird over here. Um, but, yeah, Max C. I think Max C's even got lower attack than draw bird. So, you know, Max C's even less powerful. But, you know, Max C still does the job. And you can't take away, it's one of the best hand traps in the game. No doubt about that. So, we're on to the final two. The final two of my favourite cards, and this is one of my favourite cards because of the deck that the number one card was in, and also just because it was really fun, and that was Gauze the Emissary of Darkness. Now, Gauze, another one of those hand traps that were phenomenal in the game. Hand traps are great, there's no denying that, hand traps are the best thing that I've ever I'd say possibly the best mechanic that's ever been in Yu Gi Oh! ever. Like, better than the Synchro mechanic, better than the XCs mechanic. I think that the hand trap mechanic made the deck, uh, made the game much more. 
I don't know, resource intensive. Like, you had to think about your resources more than you had to affect Veilers and Maxis because your opponent could have effect Veilers and Maxis and if your plays get stopped, then obviously, it's the same way trap cards work really, you have to keep everything in account. But if your opponent's not playing hand traps, you can go Hail Mary when they have no back row. So, and also it's cards that can't get MST'd and that's really fun. But anyway, that's my original point. So in this Monarch deck, there were basically three engines mixed into one. There was the Gen X Ally bot, Birdman board from the deck, where I bounced for Synchro Summons and things like that. Then there was the Hand Trap portion of the deck, so I ran double Gauze, double Max C, and a single Baylor. And that was because I didn't run traps in the deck. I believe I run I ran two traps and it was a bottomless and a D prison and other than that I ran nothing. Bearing in mind this was a Monarch deck when Monarch Storm Fourth wasn't around and also Dark Dust Spirit was a very much played card. So me summoning goals wasn't a smart idea if I was planning on sacking for Dark Dust Spirit next turn. But it was still a phenomenal card and also just to point out The amount of times I tribute summoned goals for game was ridiculous. Like, there were two cards that you wouldn't tribute summon for game very often, but when you did, you felt great. And goals was one of them. I didn't drop goals half the time. I even wouldn't have any back row. They'd swing into me, and then I'd just pass turn. And then next turn, I'd go, okay, treeborn frog, enemy controller, resummon treeborn frog sack both to summon goals for game and they'd just be like what was the point in that and be like just disrespect really so yeah goals makes it onto this list and the last card and my friend Alistair and my friend A Hill will understand why this card is at number one and that is Maiden with the eyes of well Maiden with eyes of blue so obviously I'm gonna put blue eyes here as well um but this is the thing, okay? So I played this Monarch deck for so long. And it was because of Alistair, really. Like, me and Alistair came up with this deck, and we were thinking of random cards to tech in. And we decided to tech in one Maiden with the Eyes of Blue, and one Blue Eyes White Dragon. Why we did this, we still have no idea. It was just kind of a. You know what? You know what? I think this card would go in good in the deck. Actually, I remember now because we were we were running a Mystic Piper engine at first. Uh, Mystic Piper obviously got Maiden. Um, we were running that Mystic Piper engine, but then we I moved over to this Gauze and Gen X Ally Birdman bullshit, and I just brought Maiden with me. And Maiden has been one of my favorite, well, literally my favorite card in the game. I've played Maiden in so many random decks. I played Maiden in Inferno at one point, just for fun. I remember I took it to locals and I ended up taking first place. And I summoned Maiden at least four times. I've played so many decent decks with Maiden in. And thank you very much for watching, guys. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go build Maiden Monarchs again. If you guys would like to see Maiden Monarchs, please leave a like on the video. Thank you so much for your support recently, guys. It means an absolute ton. And, yeah. I'll see you in a bizzle. Goodbye.